I'm sorry, Ken, but I, I need the wine glass. <laughs> so, I'm Ken Van Sickle. I studied with Chiang Man Chen from 1967 to 1975 in New York City. I, I was doing karate at the time and I, it began to be very crude to me and I needed something that had a little philosophy to it. And, and I was told that there was an old man in Chinatown who might have that. And I went uh, and I went up and took a seat in the, in the studio and uh, he walked in and, and I knew as soon as he walked in that he was the person that I was going to study with. He had the, uh, the quality of uh, a guru that I was looking for. Um, Okay, so so, what, so is me one of the questions that you need to? Um, so you, you studied uh, with uh, Cheng Man Ching for like uh, seven, eight years, right? I studied with him when he was there, maybe two or three times a week. Uh, I wish I had studied more every day of the week now, but that didn't happen. Everybody felt that way later. They said, why didn't I go all that? every day, every, every hour that he did it? You know, but, uh, that was, uh, and then, but he would go to China occasionally, uh, uh, Taiwan occasionally, and then, of course, I wasn't studying with him. But even though, when he wasn't there, and even now that he's not there, I continue to learn from him. It's like the, the vitamin, uh, vitamins, they give you a capsule, and it, over, over the days it, it becomes active, and it keeps giving you the vitamins you need, and that's the way his teaching was. And even now, I suddenly discover something that he said that I didn't know what he meant when he said it. And all of a sudden, I understand what he said because I've worked on the whole problem and I'm ready to get that one before I wasn't ready to get it. And that's the way that works. And some people, I have friends who they have dreams about him and they learn things from him. I, I had one dream where I learned uh, from him. And, and he showed up and he was covered with little needles. He was all with little needles sticking in him, on his acupuncture points, I believe. And uh, he told me something there right now, I don't remember which one it was, but that was a nice experience. Uh, one of my friends, uh, he appeared to him, he said he appeared to him at night in front of his bed, as real as life itself, and, and told him that he was a lineage descendant and that he, could, he should take this and, and show it to the world, you know. And, which is what he said to us basically in the beginning, that we, we need to get this out to people who want it because the, the world is going to be in a health crisis and this would be, Tai Chi and Qigong would be one of the solutions to it. Yeah, one day uh, a man came from uh, Taiwan who was a student of Chen Man Chang, or no, he came from San, San Francisco to visit Maggie's studio. And Maggie was uh, she was having stomach trouble, so he, he, he also was a healer, so he, she lay on the floor and he did, he felt different parts of her body and then he finally said to her, you need to eat meat. And she said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I said, Maggie, you should go out into a pasture and, and get a sheep and rip its throat apart <laughs> and suck the blood. <laughs> so that, I, I made a joke out of it. But uh, then she asked him what his diet was and he said, everything eat. <laughs> Um, so I studied with a few other people after I studied, after Chen Man Cheng died. I, I stayed with Maggie a while and, and assisted her. Maggie Newman. Maggie right? Newman, mm -hmm. yes. And then I studied uh, a little bit with Don An, who was also a student of Chen Man Cheng, but more advanced than me. And, uh, and a little bit later with Kumar Francis, uh, some Bagua, and some introduced to the Wu form a little bit. And then uh, B.P. Chan, who was a, 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 a man, I think, from, he had been all around the East and he had studied in, with many masters, I think. And he had a very interesting viewpoint on it. And I studied the uh, Chen form with him for about six months and then I decided I'm having enough to do, to doing the, the Chen Man Cheng form. I didn't need another one to get away, so I stopped everything else. I stopped studying with other people and I just concentrated on doing Chen Man Cheng's form. Uh, May I ask uh, B.P. Chan, was it that B.P. Chan was teaching also in uh, William C. C. Chen School? B.P. Chan and Dr. Tao both were very close friends of William Chen and they would come to New York to his school to teach. 
they didn't try to set up another school. They studied, uh, they taught in his school, and so I would go to uh, to, to push hands with Dr. Tao, mm. and then B. P. Chen was also teaching another friend of mine um, um, uh, uh, privately, and I would I would go study with him also. But I just the Chen form was too much for me. He also taught the Yang long form, and mm -hmm. he was a very very interesting man as well. So that was interesting. And otherwise, then I stopped uh, studying with other people, and I depended then on studying Chen Manchang's form by listening to the principles and examining the movements and seeing how the what could this be if I if I have to move that way if I have to do that what could I be doing because when you move in certain directions you can only be doing one thing or another and I, so I investigated things and I tried concepts that I would come across well maybe it's this or maybe it's this and I would try them out to see if they worked and if they worked I said okay that's one of the applications you know? And because I didn't, men, uh, he didn't teach many applications uh, on 211 Canal Street or at 87 Bowery. He, uh, he was waiting for, I, I think he was waiting for us to get better root and, and, and more chi before he did that. But uh, I learned some applications from the older students like Lou Klein-Smith, uh, Ed Young, and Tam Gibbs. And uh, he would come in occasionally with a little bright look in his eye, which I figured was that he had a, a few drinks, because he liked to do that. And uh, he would come in with that, and I knew I could learn an application if I just attacked him in the right way. <laughs> and uh, that worked out okay, but not, not many, because he, he didn't want to do that too much. Um, so was it then mainly form and, and free fencing, or what did you do? Well, he. he uh, we started off with form class, and that, that lasted about nine months. He would do about one movement a week. He first come in to show us the movement, over and over, like then, and then he was let the assistants uh, take over to teach the movement from, from then on. But each time we would come in to do the class, he'd come to start it off and, sh and make, make sure that he was showing everybody that you know, when we would do this, he'd go, oh, and relax. And uh, then after about nine months, we'd start, we started push hands and form correction. So he, he, you know, those would happen at the same time, which was a very good thing. And then about nine months later, he started sword form, which in, in old China, the, they didn't start sword form until about 10 years after you did the form. Uh, but he had to change his way of doing things when he came to New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, in China, everybody, the masters were sitting up higher than you and they were looking down and they very seldom really come down and, and play with you that much, apparently. He took one look at New York City in the 60s, uh, they, they looked at all the hippies and he came in 62, 63 or 64, I'm not sure, 64. Some say 63, some say 64. He came to show his paintings at, at the UN. Uh, anyway, he took one well, one look or a week, I don't know, he, but he saw it, that wouldn't work here. It, it wouldn't work, and if it doesn't work, it, he was pragmatic. He wanted to do what was going to work and to whom it was going to work on. So he changed his whole attitude, and he was well, among us with his hands on us, our hands on him all the time. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, later on, uh, certain people who had studied him in Taiwan, in Taiwan with him in Taiwan, would say, especially Ben Lo, we were fencing with him. He didn't get to fence with him, you know? And he said he was jealous about the whole thing because he was much more open because we were, you know? We weren't like kowtow students, so we couldn't, couldn't do it. And that was, that was quite, and he took women and everybody, women, young, young, old, beards. He did tell us that in China, if you have a beard, that means you, you should be a certain age to do that. You shouldn't just grow a beard when you're that young. So comes, and so Wolf Lowenthal shaved his beard off immediately. Uh, I was a little older and I, I had a mustache, but I, I kept that. I, was, I, was, I needed that, I, so I kept it. Mm -hmm.